Excellent. Fantastic. And um, Stacy and folks are kind of staying in that other room to be able to kind of usher people forward. Um, so we may have some late comers as well. Um, I am uh, uh, going to just give uh, Dr. Gaskins a brief introduction. Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Gaskins, feel free to try to launch your um, slides in that time as, as, we're, as we're moving forward. Many of you got to, to meet uh, Dr. Gaskins earlier today, um, and, and many of you are, are rejoining us here. The talk that, that um, she's going to give today is on interrogating maker culture and STEAM education. Uh, many of you are interested in this, this broader movement, and, uh, and, and so she's going to bring her unique background um, as, a, as a teacher, writer, uh, uh, you know, digital, digital designer, artist, um, AI specialist, and machine learning um, to the fore as she's talking about this work. Uh, um, she has a, a, a BFA in computer graphics with honors from Pratt Institute in 1992, an MFA in art and technology from the School of Art um, Institute of Chicago in 1994. Uh, Natrice uh, received a, a doctorate in digital media from Georgia Tech in, in 2014. So it's a very unique background and folding of, of artists and academic and, and uh, researcher and educator uh, that comes to, to the fore here. Uh, currently, Dr. Gaskins is a 2021 uh, Ford Global Fellow, which is a huge, huge honor um, for those of you that, that understand uh, what that means. If not, that's a good, great question for Dr. Gaskins. Uh, currently, she's a position as an assistant director at the Leslie Steam Learning Lab at Leslie University um, and sits on the advisory uh, board for the School of Literature, Media, and Communication at Georgia Tech, uh, which, which is huge. Uh, um, you know, other testaments to, uh, you know, her, her growing popularity and impact. Um, she has her uh, first full length book treatment out through MIT Press. Um, for those of you connected to the Creativity Labs, or if you'd like to, to read a copy, we've got several copies at the lab. Um, the title of the book is on techno vernacular creativity and innovation. Um, and uh, much of what, uh, what uh, she has to say in that book is going to be talked about here, the theory um, and, and the practice um, and the art of that work as well. Um, Dr. Gaskin's uh, AI generated artworks um, have really really uh, become, you know, a, an international phenom uh, over the past few years and can be viewed, you know, if you haven't done so, go ahead and just Google and read, uh, you know, kind of see the links of what she's written in journals, magazines, museums. Um, she's also one of the, the featured futurists um, uh, in the, uh, for her, her portraits. Um, they're on view at the Smithsonian Arts and Industries building through early July, 2022. So if you have summer travel, you're planning to be in the DC area, uh, please do check that work out. Um, it, it just, you know, I've just gotten a few glimpses uh, from my, my computer. It looks amazing. So without further ado, thank you, uh, Dr. Gaskins, for being patient with our, with our technology uh, squabbles here. And we very, very, very much look forward uh, to your talk today. Thanks, Kylie. And hello, everyone. It's in the afternoon, it's early evening here. So um, it's a little different time, but um, I'll put some slides together to talk about kind of why I did the work that I did um, and do, um, it's kind of my day job. So on one hand, I'm Dr. Natrice Gaskins and this is that work. And then on the artist side, I'm just Natrice Gaskins. Um, but you know what I thought about uh, maker culture, because that's kind of what I'm looking at um, for the book. But the question is who gets to make and who, depending on who you talk to, right? So on um, we have um, what's a, what seems to be a, a white boy on the left and um, maybe a girl, definitely a girl, but um, a black girl on the right. Um, one says, I'm a maker. And you can see the thought bubble where the person's thinking about making in one way. And this is a Carnegie Mellon uh, University kind of in, a, in a, you know, working with the electronics and the robotics and all that kind of stuff. And on the, on the right, the students thinking about making in their own way, but then thinking about maybe that maybe they're not a maker based on 
and kind of the mainstream and dominant picture of who gets who, who makes and what making is. Um, but you can also apply the same thing to who gets to code, who gets to design and who gets to build. The perceptions of who gets to do those things change according to who you talk to. And I found myself uh, being in situations where it would be a robotics club in a high school, all boys and maybe one girl, um, um, all boys, one girl, all white. Um, or, you know, all boys and maybe more diverse groups, but no girls. So I never really see a very diverse group when you're thinking about the traditional ways of thinking about making robotics, electronics, digital fabrication, those things, um, because that's one um, aspect of making, right? It's not um, every aspect of making, and maybe it's not even called making. And that's really what's been um, a, a focus of my work. And so, um, and, and how does that have an impact on a student's self-esteem or even their self-concept, what they, they see themselves as? Do they see themselves as makers or even see themselves as scientists? Do they see themselves as coders or uh, you know, engineers? And if they don't have any of that reflected back at them or to them, or they don't see themselves in those spaces, it's because, even if they're interested in it, it becomes a, de a deterrent or becomes something that tracks them somewhere else. Um, so I, I just like this because it's looking at kind of all the different things that make up the self. Um, but you have, you know, I've talked to engineers from GE who will say that they were discouraged from going in a particular track that leads to engineering by their teachers. And it wasn't just um, one engineer, it was actually an engineer at the table, this is at Simmons College. And it was the mother of someone going into going to engineer, the same thing, uh, engineering, the same thing was happening to their child. Um, being tracked somewhere else and saying, picking up either verbally or non-verbally that that wasn't the field for them. So it happens in, you know, outside externally, and then it impacts internally, it has, it creates the sense of who they, who you might be and what you could possibly be. So, um, and then it shows up in the statistics um, here where we see, this is from the National Science Foundation. Um, and when I look at this every couple of years, this report comes out, um, on, on women and minorities in terms of who's in STEM. And uh, you can see here, this is a couple of years ago. And um, in terms of uh, African-American uh, for engineering is 3.9%. And if, if the uh, population of African-Americans in the United States is at 13, 14%, that's really low. Um, and you can see it, it's kind of the same here and there for science and maybe another and technology, things like that. Uh, but for non se it's a little higher. Um, and non SNE means uh, education, humanities, and the arts, where you have more representation um, with Black and Latino students and women. Um, so that, that self-concept, that idea plays a huge role. And um, by the time they're hitting middle school or 12 or 13 years old, when they decide, you know, this isn't for me, even though I really like science, I really like technology um, or computer science, I'm not going to do those things because um, I don't see anyone like me and I don't feel comfortable in those spaces or include it. Oh, There's also, you know, the College Board has been gathering some data and they expanded their computer science courses to draw more girls and minorities in 2018. And um, I highlighted this part where it says um, for the, this particular teacher, creative component and the collaborative component are huge in drawing students, especially for underrepresented groups. They're getting to see that computer science is for them. Um, so, and that came from um, the Washington Post, I believe, uh, uh, um, from 2020. Uh, so I actually taught AP computer science principles. I taught that course and the majority of my students were girls and most of them were black and Latino, although I did have a white student and um, some Asian students as well, but predominantly black and Latino and um, mostly girls. So I got a, the experience firsthand what it was like to teach uh, computer science and all of them had arts majors. So um, really connecting computer science concepts to art was a focus of my curriculum, my syllabus. Um, on the right is a picture of me. And that is me at age 18 or 17. Um, in high school, I actually visual, I was a visual arts major, but that's the first time I actually used a computer um, at age 17 or 18, even though my mother was a computer programmer. Um, once I learned how to use the computer to make art, I was in. I was all the way in. I went and majored in computer graphics and um, as an undergrad and art and technology as a grad student and digital media as a PhD. 
But I also, there's an inset photo of me doing some etching on a bronze plate. So doing some printmaking. So I was also traditionally doing the traditional visual art uh, techniques as well. Um, so my foundation is those things, is the computation through um, computer graphics and also traditional art. And so that statement about the draw for students who are girls and minorities, I just think about myself. And that was what brought me into the co um, computer side of things was art. So when I think about making, this is making. This is Loretta Bennett. She's a fifth generation quilter whose ancestry can be traced back to uh, Dinah Miller, one of the first slaves to arrive in Gee's Bend, Alabama. She started sewing at the age of five and by age of 12 made her first quilt um, in advanced design and octagonal shaped blocks entirely by hand. So you can see her piecing together a quilt here using um, you know, jeans and pants and, and work materials along with some colored fabric um, on a particular uh, type of uh, design. Um, but I think when I think of making, think about this um, as making. This is also mathematics. So there's another quilt by Loretta on the, le on the left. And then on the right, um, this is a math uh, activity. We're actually doing that from Leslie University right now with a seventh grade math class in New Jersey, where the math teacher is introducing g spin quilts and they're exploring, the students are exploring ratios, fractions, decimals, percents, or, in, or differences. And so this is a, a layout, um, a, a, a pattern that is actually embedded in the code of Questlove and um, that he wore on stage to get his Oscar. So that, it, um, I actually did uh, kind of uh, work, uh, worked on that and, and came up with the decimal fractions and percents. So it's mathematics, it's math, um, as well as, as, well as uh, making. It's also computation. So um, there's something called shape grammars, which are rule-based systems that compute with shapes. And this has been extended to uh, computational thinking or making with things, especially through craft performances like quilting and other social aspects of design that are deeply imbued with unique cultural values and express, expressive of cultural identities. So um, in the middle is uh, examples of some shape rules and uh, derivations and other designs that are very similar to quilts. So it's very algorithmic, um, the process of building out the quilt that Loretta is doing. Now she has no computer, but she is uh, thinking computationally when she creates her design. It's also what I call techno vernacular creativity. So um, Loretta's style, the approach she takes to quilting has a history. Um, and um, the history can be linked to Ghanaian kente cloth, you see in the center, and kuba cloth, which is on the far right um, from West Central Africa and Ghana um, and, uh, and the kente cloth. These, these influences show up in the G-spin quilts, um, sometimes very direct. And when you think about that, these women come from, um, their ancestors came over the, over, over the ships as enslaved people who people thought didn't bring with them anything, but they brought with them their knowledge of making things like kente cloth or cuba cloth. And that shows up in the quilt making. And so it becomes an approach to things. And now the quilt making, this particular type of quilt making has been linked to music through improvisation and also to some other things I'll talk about. But I call this techno vernacular creativity, which refers to innovations produced by ethnic groups that are often overlooked, such as traditional African-American quilting, TVC. So some researchers, um, they uh, compared uh, TVC with Gambiara, which is uh, impro an improvised and informal way of solving everyday problems when needed tools or resources are not available. So this is an actual maker movement in Brazil. And um, some researchers actually compared my uh, concept for my uh, techno vernacular creativity concept to uh, Gambiera. Um, and you can, this, is, this is an example of one project of using an old phone to create something new with it. So, um, and then there's a whole paper around that and it's done for a new music research project. Um, but I found that very interesting that they would do that comparison and that maybe there is something about um, what's happening in different um, places around the world that does lend to this kind of practice in TVC. Um, Resquashimo from Mexico and Chicano culture, 
Um, the body spunky sensibility of Rasquashimo in, in initiates strategies to subvert and turn ruling paradigms upside down, recreating American icons such, such as lowrider cars with oppositional meaning and function. So you can see this is an example of kind of, you know, what you might find in Rasquashimo. And then of course, lowrider cars, which are um, really popular in hip hop and also in uh, Chicana culture as well, which where it came from. Afrofuturism um, is another kind of um, example where we um, provide an intersectional lens through which people can view possible futures or alternate realities. Practitioners use speculative design to connect cultural artifacts and performances to bring social justice issues to light for open discussion. Um, the picture here is from IOPO Repository, which is a project um, that required some specul speculative design and design thinking to produce an archive of prototypes. And then some of those prototypes were, were worked on and became real like this example. And I'll talk more about that um, in, in a few slides. But this is another example where we might see what is was, uh, sort of labeled as making um, or even steam um, in Afrofuturism. Oh, and I'll say that I know that this suit is, uh, it takes, it takes a, it's a play on the middle passage and the idea of maybe trauma. And so it's like a trauma suit um, is a prototype so that it sort of helps a person deal with trauma. And when you put this on, it sort of feel, you know, it reads your body and reads the trauma in your body and sort of reroutes water and things to areas to cool it off and things like that. So that I know that this is a trauma suit just based on um, what I know about the project, but it initially began as field notes and a prototype um, in a workshop. So what do these ways of doing or making have in common? So the three modes of techno vernacular creativity include this one, which is reappropriation. It's the cultural process by which marginalized or underrepresented ethnic groups reclaim artifacts from dominant culture and the environment. So they take things that are in the trash or take things that have been discarded or old and make them new again or make them into something they were not intended to be when they were first manufactured. So this is Kelvin Doe, who as a kid, he's now an adult, but as a kid, he was known as DJ Focus and he would pull things out of the garbage and turn them into things to, um, to either help him with his DJing or to help his community such as batteries or some sort of power that they could use when they had blackouts. So um, just you know, tinkering and re-engineering or taking things apart and putting them back together again out of necessity, but also with a sense of creativity was something that um, I found across the board. Remixing is amplified by widespread access to computer technology in terms of why I define it, whereby existing works are rearranged, combined or remixed into a new work, a song, a section of artwork, a block of code, a book, a video or a lesson plan. And this example, this is a group of middle, this is middle school students that I actually did some research with as a PhD student in Georgia. And they are testing out or trying out um, Afrofuturism software, which is a, a culturally, culturally situated design tool or CSDT based on the work of Saya Wolfalk, who is a um, biracial um, visual artist and is, um, 3D artist um, who I know and, and was, we were able to work with her and two other artists to produce so software to teach kids about computational thinking, um, doing coding through like a scratch like uh, uh, language um, uh, platform and also how to simulate the artwork using the program and learning more about math and computer science by doing it. But focus on Afrofuturism. And then improvisation is the third mode. And that refers to the spontaneous and inventive use of materials and content um, that elicits uh, the active engagement or participation of underrepresented ethnic communities. And this picture, we have um, some wire bending going on. And wire bending is a practice that uh, is in the Caribbean, particularly around carnival. And this is Trinidad carnival, where you see the wire bending happening to build the framework for the costumes that are worn in the parades and celebrations around Trinidad carnival. And so this is a passed down generation, just like the quilting um, from generation to generation. And this is also a, a, a practice that's being lost um, so it's a lost kind of practice that people are trying to regain through computation, such as Vernell Noel and some others around the grammars, the making grammars of wire bending and um, this improvisation 
that's happening to create this work becomes computational um, now, today, to sort of hold on to those to tradition and to those practices. So um, making is doing, you know, after all that, making is doing and sensing with stuff to make things. So doing and sensing being a very important part, but the stuff is where we get the diversity. So the stuff could be data, it could, you know, and that data could consist of songs it could, or music, it consist of, of visual art, it can consist of dance performances, um, quilt patterns, um, various other things. Um, but this is making this becomes this kind of broader idea as opposed to just working with, you know, what we think of in terms of Western um, or dominant um, approaches to making things. Um, so stuff is data, I mean, biggest stuff. So this is um, uh, an, an app that we developed in 2021, um, sponsored by Mozilla around Trinidad Carnival. So we were thinking about, you know, the celebration um, initially when we thought about coming up with this project, me, um, Vernell Noel, who's the architect and uh, Val um, Valencia James, who's a dancer from Barbados, who's based in LA. We thought about how we could use artificial intelligence, specifically pose estimation and PoseNet to create an app to, to sort of do output around this idea of carnival. And so um, you see the link there, but we also, the reason why we did it was in response to news about the creative strike of black TikTokers, creative um, black TikTokers um, who were um, protesting what was happening when their dances were sort of appropriated by white influencers on TikTok who would then take and then not credit the dancers and then um, you know, um, sort of poorly recreate those dances, but then it would become popular and um, and the, the again those uh, black creators would be marginalized. So we create our own platform, our own app to celebrate carnival, and the dancers would meet with us in Zoom, and we would dance together to and 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 gather data um, to create this uh, project. So stuff is data um, is important. Um, artifact. Um, this is IOPO repository again. I mentioned it before with the trauma suit. This is another example. Um, uh, Ayo Okusinde sent me this picture. This is a artifact that alerts wearers to geolocations where Black people have been extrajudiciously, just, 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 I'm going to get this word, extrajudicially killed. And the device syncs with a database. So this is a prototype for this device that. Um, is, is helpful in the community and sort of addresses the whole thing about um, uh, racial profiling and what's been happening with uh, police and black people. Um, the middle project, um, um, not the only one, is Stephanie Dinkins Storytelling AI Robot. It's driven by a training data set that repurposes texts from Toni Morrison Sula and family interviews. So you can go up to this AI, you can see these people doing that here and talk to it and ask it questions and then it responds based on the data that's been um, in, input from Stephanie and her team. Um, currently this AI robot is next to my work at the Smithsonian um, in Washington, DC. So we're exhibited in our own little section, my work, uh, Stephanie's uh, robot and Octavia Butler's typewriter are in the same area um, at the Smithsonian. Um, Ayo Okusunde um, also uh, explores this through his work. Uh, he critiques algorithms as languages of exclusion, challenging people to reconsider the ontologies and predictive power of such, such systems. And he really looks at, interrogates um, AI and um, uses cultural data to uh, create a different type of AI um, than maybe the mainstream would create. So more and more artists who are black and brown are really taking um, to looking at AI and, uh, and interrogating it, but also looking at how it can be used creatively in a positive way, as opposed to a negative, um, when we think about uh, racial profiling and surveillance and all that and racial and algorithmic, bi algorithmic bias and all that kind of stuff that's happening. We also think about um, some positive creative ways of using AI. Um, I was in the airport um, coming back from Atlanta a couple of weeks ago and I heard, um, I didn't see which air, air, airline it was, but I overheard them say that um, they were gonna use uh, facial recognition to do uh, the board instead of boarding passes. So you just scan your face and then you could go into the, um, to your plane. And then I saw, I was just writing a paper about this actually right there at the airport. And I was looking at research from the Algorithmic Justice League that shows that um, 
for black women, especially, it's like the failure rate of the AI for facial recognition was at over 50%. And so, you know, they also said if the A facial AI didn't work, then they would do the boarding pass. But I thought, you know, for me, I would have to do the boarding pass, probably wouldn't be able to read my face. So um, that's the negative impact um, of that. But it's already showing up in like airports and stuff like that. And, and it's not ready for, for us. So translating these diverse making practices to STEAM learning requires a new framework or approach. And so um, if you come, if you apply a European or not a Western lens on some of these works, you will miss the nuances that are there that really make uh, a very rich um, exploration of, of, of how making um, is happening in different communities. And again, it may not be called making, it may be called some of the things like I mentioned before, like with squash, with squash and mow and um, that and it has a whole, you know, different way of techniques and, and practices and customs that are not found in traditional or dominant mainstream making practices. So it requires a new lens, a new framework or approach. Um, I tried to think, started thinking about uh, coming to, up with a toolkit that kind of would help um, identify kinds of things you would pull out to be able to create curriculum or a syllabus and curriculum and lessons and activities to, to really incorporate TVC into a, a, a lesson or activity. So modulating um, this idea of breaking down systems into smaller parts that can be independently created and modified and replaced and exchanged between different systems is one thing I looked at, translation or translating, but a trans transforming dominant ideas into locally relevant and responsive designs. And so, um, like math, for example, math concepts into quilting, acting on, to, on what is fixed or constant to make things that are flexible, cyclical, or dynamic. Um, combining, so layering and merging different forms and materials and sources to make new things, um, putting them together in such a way that each move in a, uh, in a work uh, determines a subsequent action or response. So call and response participation, for example, is a historic uh, practice in African-American and African diasporic. Um, practice uh, cultures where there's a, uh, and color and response can a lot of times found in music, but you can also find it in the quilting as well. There's encoding, so using alteration or adaptation to redeploy the material and symbolic power of cultural artifacts, embedding cultural symbols and rituals in the making process. There's patterning, so performing operations and practicing algebraic thinking and using geometric properties such as rotation, reflection, Dilation, um, I, should, I always tell myself to fix this slide, but dilation, all the sort of ge geometry uh, concepts uh, with patterning. Um, repeating, making things that perform in cyclical or looping patterns, um, call and response participation again, um, to iterate on existing works, reiteration through rhythm, interval, scale, and the proportion of artifacts. Um, think a lot about repetition. It's very much a part of black cultural production. And so, um, and, and maybe some other cultures as well, when you think about other groups that are non-Western who form cy ciphers or circles um, to uh, work together, produce some music or dance performances or even craft. Um, this is, uh, oftentimes you'll find repetition in those uh, situations. Um, so TVC Learning Institute, so situated in a STEAM lab, for example, in this picture, the situated learning theory, theory affirms that education is not possible without taking into account what happens outside of a given social cultural con context. And then that implies that education should focus on the relationships between subjects, artifacts, knowledge, community, and the culture. Uh, this is a, I was running a STEAM lab um, when I finished school at Georgia Tech. I built the STEAM lab in a high school for the visual and performing arts. And the students wanted to have a, a rap cipher on Wednesdays um, in the STEAM lab. They do, there's a big school, so this is the, they were in the cafeteria, then they wanted to be in this lab. So they came and they would do this. And so we decided to do like a maker, hip hop, call and response kind of thing on one of those days. Uh, but the idea that they could come here and form that kind of circle, that cipher and, and do that on their own. This is their group um, with some faculty advisors, but this is them just really experiment, um, exploring the space and being in a, together in a circle. So teachers are in this circle. I see some engineer, engineering teacher here. Um, they're all there and part of the same communities with the same group. Um, how did, how that, so until someone asked me earlier today about how that plays a role in how I 
teach in my lessons and, and how I go about managing a class. So I often use design ciphers and concept mapping um, as a design thinking brainstorming activity around the idea of the cipher. So in this example, you see a concept map for a device called iWriter. And um, an iWriter is, you know, was not, on this, it was a, for a graffiti artist who uh, was of color who had ALS or has ALS, it can't move um, below the neck or below the, maybe the chin even. Um, and now with this iWriter system is able to, to do graffiti even though he no longer can move his, his limbs. Um, so his name is Tempt, Tempt One. Um, so if you look at Tempt One, just as him as an artist, he comes from Chicano culture. We talk about with Squashimo. He uh, combined, he is known as a legend. He combined Chicano style with New York style graffiti tags. And that was what he was known for before he became ill. So he's able to still do that through the movement of his eyes using this sort of eyeglasses and um, sensor-based system called iWriter. So it just breaking out, having students, and this was middle school, breaking out all the different things, the biomechanics of it, the, the accessories of it, the other research projects that may have come out of that, like graffiti analysis, that may come, come out of this group, the physical computing, um, ALS from the health side or biology, of genetics, head injury, by, and, and sports even, thinking about how that might impact um, people that they would need this kind of system. So the students did this uh, research, produced their own concept maps, and then in the middle, you can see them prototyping their ideas using found objects or things from home, such as uh, tape or cardboard, or aluminum foil, um, you know, and this is a circle, they're in a circle here working on their prototype. And their prototype they're working on is a remix of the iWriter project. So they uh, really like that. And um, these are all girls in this particular group um, working on this project. And then collaborative peer review, where they form a cipher again, and they go from table to table and look at their other projects students have done in their groups, and they do a type of critique um, and give feedback to the students still kind of in the circle cipher formation. And so um, it, this is how it kind of plays a role and, and when I teach, and I kind of do this type of grouping a lot um, when I'm teaching um, with students and it makes them feel included. It gives everybody a, a, a sense that they, they matter and that it's important that their, that their words and their projects and their ideas are all um, together uh, when they're working. So, um, so I, at, when, we, when the pandemic hit, um, we'll go back to the slide, this particular biomechanical cyborg, which is kind of also based on Afrofuturism, was a project that I did in person in Long Beach, California for this particular um, um, example. And then when the pandemic hit, I continued to use, do this uh, workshop on Zoom because the materials are found objects and things they had around the house. So they could still do some aspect of this and still go through. The only thing we didn't do online was difficult was the collaborative peer review because it was difficult to go, they couldn't go around from table to table. But we did the, the design ciphers and concept mapping and prototyping via Zoom. And I did this for two, almost two years um, with some other students from Long Beach. Um, so a lot of the, my experiences, all the things that I started to think about, all that kind of comes together in the book um, that you see here on the left, but it also came together in these instructables that I made to sort of help people during the pandemic, like help teachers still do things around um, hands-on project-based things with students. So we did the cipher in Tinkercad um, and there's a collaborative feature of Tinkercad that allows everyone to come together and work on the same project, a 3D model. So we did this 3D uh, quilting using Tinkercad. Um, dance um, performances in chemistry. So using an electronic or conductive paint as an interface, there's an activity there, um, exploring data visualization through pixel art and sonification of that, um, of that, of that data to introduce students to that. Um, we also looked at quilt making um, in three dimensions. So looking at it from a sculptural 3D, uh, making things out of 3D objects, um, that was another instructable. Um, so different things here. Um, more recently um, doing something around the quilts and um, their science story quilts to look at self-concept in terms of students seeing themselves as scientists and also who they define as scientists, not necessarily what we tell them who, they, who is a scientist. And so that happened. Um, and um, I wanna leave room for questions. So 
Um, I never really talk about my art, but uh, the cover of the book is one of my early pieces. It's a student, a student that I had um, when I was teaching at the high school or had the lab at the high school. And that's when I started first using um, artificial intelligence to generate portraits. And so in this case, uh, the data was the input, was the source image, it was the um, uh, African fabrics and things that I was really into at the time, quilts uh, that became the image style for that portrait. And, um, and that was the beginning of my journey towards the work that I currently do. Um, but um, I'll leave room for questions, but I'll stop sharing some slides now. Fantastic. You know, I, I'm getting all these these uh, privately shared messages with me like, like ah! <laughs> so they're very, there's a lot of excitement in the room. And I, I actually always wanted to know the story behind that image on the cover. So thank you. Mm -hmm. It's good to get behind the scenes. Let's go ahead and just open it up for questions. Um, you know, I think if we can let the, the grad students uh, take the floor first, that, that would be that would be very much appreciated. All right. And and definitely, uh, you know, don't just send me your kudos. Uh, do do post them publicly too. All right. Okay. Go ahead and jump in. Um, I, I'm not going to call on folks because I don't want to take up any of our time. People absorbing, thinking. Yeah, I, I think they're trying to decide if like if they're gonna like interrupt the next talk. <laughs> so uh, Santiago, why don't you go ahead? I, I, I know you have some ideas. Yeah, well, I am amazed by uh, how, how you are connecting really culturally relevant traditions and with making. So uh, I'm just impressed. I want to buy your book. Uh, I want to have it right now. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if you can uh, go a little bit deeper on the Chicano thing. Uh, I would, I, I, I was curious about that. There's a film that came out when I graduated called Underwater Dreams. I don't know if you know if you've ever seen it, but it was about a high school in Phoenix, Arizona, um, in a robotics class. And the students, they were um, the sons of uh, undocumented uh, workers who went to um, a robotics competition and beat MIT. So it's a documentary about that, their story. So uh, I went to the Museum of Science here in Boston and then they had a panel after the movie where one of those um, men were, uh, was on the panel and somebody had, had already gone through my PhD process and the TVC stuff. And they asked him, what made you get into robotics? You know, what made you, and he was like hitting switches. And as soon as he said that, I said, that's TVC. They were already, once they made the connection to what they had in their community and that, and, and hit and switches is low rider terminology. Hit and switches is how they repurpose uh, cars. And so he has already seen that type of work in terms of engineering happening in his community. So he and his peers just said, we, we could do that. We could do underwater robotics. And they were good, obviously good enough to beat MIT at a competition. Um, now, the other side of that is because they were from und undocumented families, they could not go to MIT. So they beat MIT, but none of them were able to go. So a lot of them were caterers or work, uh, working on um, lawn stuff, or, but they weren't a not able to go. And I think one of them managed to go to engineering school, I think after going through the military, I forget the whole story. But the whole point is that what the click, the thing that clicked for them was low rider culture and they connected it to robotics. And that's a perfect example of that, that, that scene of the making that's happening in the community locally and using that as an inspiration to get more students into robotics is one way to do that, like one way to go there. Um, and so low rider culture is something that a lot of us know about because we've seen the cars go up and down and, so, you know, and, and do that stuff. But there's a whole culture of just doing that that's been going on for decades. It comes out of a you know a Chicano DIY aesthetic and, and mindset. Yes, and another thing I want to to highlight is uh, when you when you compared uh, your paintings or and your drawings with computing and how they like uh, computing computational processes were 
anal like analog computational processes were included in the making of those uh, paintings or pictures, I was I just can't help but thinking on very strong ge geometrical cultures or geometrical uh, graphic culture that is so present in Latin America, and I was just thinking on wow intersections between learning, computational thinking, arts, and Latin American culture are right there. I was so inspired by that connection. And I just want to add that that could be made not, not just in making, because of course, there's a whole, I was telling Kelly, like textile culture on making geometric textiles in Latin America, but also in, in what, what you did there, like graphic, like we, with or without the, the textiles, with or without the, the making. So really inspiring and uh, thank you for that. Thank you for bringing that to this space, thank you. Sure. And um, it was a, even a moment when I worked in New Mexico I, for a couple of times, I went out there to do a two, three, one time a three week workshop um, you know, with a youth and applying the same approach there had some less similar results to when I was an African American was although the cultural connections were different, um, but just acknowledging it was just almost enough. It was the icebreaker that really brought them into the conversation and brought them into the work. Um, when I was in Albuquerque, we were looking at um, pottery designs and math instead of quilts. From and uh, they really went went there with the research for a week. To, to identify designs that they wanted to sort of remix and create a mural with. But again, the engagement was there just the way it would be somewhere else. Um, and I found, we you know, I was in Spain and working with students um, that were immigrant students in, in um, Barcelona. And then I went across town and worked with more uh, uh, like a private school. And you could see the differences in terms of self-concept. The private school students were kind of, you know, we do this. Meanwhile, there's some trepidation with the immigrant students, um, but you know, with some hand, like with some encouragement, they were able to still do the same activity. But it was a big difference. You could see the difference, um, and it does matter. You can't just have a class and have um, you have to make some of these connections up front. Thank you, thank you for that. Yeah, Spanish architecture and Spanish art and its influences in Latin America are really geometrical and really related to what you say. Sophie. So inspiring, everything you say. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Santiago. We've got a question from, from Maria. She's wondering, what kind of settings do your projects usually take place in? Is it formal schooling, after school settings, summer camps? And like, what, what do you look for when you're looking for a community to work with? I'm like, you're at Long Beach, you're just like inches away from us, you know? So um, so, so tell us more about your settings. Um, for the book, I try to include formal settings like in the classroom with the biomechanical cyborg project and also working with the youth in Albuquerque and Taos, New Mexico where they were happening more as a uh, enrichment or after school, out of school time activity. Um, the Taos um, situation was really amazing because we were working with a, a Pueblo. Um, and so we actually had a elder who was recruiting um, through their art center, um, young people to come into the high school um, for a couple of, you know, for a week or two to work with us on a project. And so um, very much so trying to make them feel included um, was important, but I don't try so hard. I do it no matter where I'm at. Um, but just acknowledging and allowing them to share their culture, share who they are, um, is half the battle sometimes with kids to leave them open for new things that maybe is more challenging for them. They're willing to take it on, even if it's harder or more of a challenge for them because they may, you're making the connections for them um, in terms of helping to see where they might connect to something in their everyday lives or in their cultures. So yeah, there's formal and informal situ um, scenarios that are in the book, not just, and sometimes they choose me, I don't choose them. Um, people, you know, will offer me a, re a residency um, or to, you know, like we did last summer, go in and do four weeks of robotics, AI and artificial intelligence with students. Yeah, we got we got folks here. They're like, you didn't work with dramatic results or, uh, you know, did you? <laughs> I work with dramatic result results. <laughs> Okay, they do it. They do it. All right, all right. And in fact, I'll be working with them in about a week, week or two. Oh, all right. So I've been working with them ongoing since uh since the pandemic hit. There you go. There you go. The answers to those questions. Mm -hmm. Um. All right. You know, faculty, feel free to jump in too. I know Michelle's posting something. 
now, now's your moment, Nikki. I, I, all the stuff on G's Ben's quilts. I, I'm sure you are dying to ask a question. Uh, hey, is it okay if I ask a question? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> hey, so uh, Dr. Gaskins, thank you again for the talk. It's really great. Also, thank you for meeting with me earlier today. Um, I wonder, could you talk a little bit more about how you use the term STEAM as opposed to the term STEM? And could you say a little bit more about what the stakes of that distinction are in your work? Sure. Um, even with the word STEM, when STEM was invented, um, coined, um, the whole point was about around global competitiveness. They wanted to find a way to stay competitive globally in the sciences and technology and all this stuff. But what they found is that didn't work. Um, there was something missing from, from that. So then in around 2011, 2010, they said, well, what happens when you add art to the mix? Meaning something creative, although you can be creative in design, it's a different process than it is when you're doing um, art, um, just art for alone. So um, when I gave the example of G's being quilts, we're, we're um, working with a math teacher, but he's going to do with hand, hold, hand holding, meaning I have to demonstrate it to some degree it, to start, but he's, we are really helping teachers make the link between the concepts in math that the students are required to know and this kind of historical, cultural, even personal for some of the students connections of that, those concepts in their lives um, and their histories. And so um, the art component comes in the product, like the, pra the practice, I'm not the practice, but sometimes the practice, but the product, like what they're making. Um, an example I give it of Seymour Papert and constructionism would be, was the purple constructionism um, concept that I, that I wrote about and about an uh, example. Um, I had, um, when I was in the STEAM lab at Boston Arts Academy, um, I had three students, three boys come to the STEAM lab um, after, uh, during class because their teacher had had it with them and they were bored with their traditional jazz and classical music that they were getting. So they were gonna get credit if they made a project in the STEAM lab. So they came down and they wanted to make a MIDI controller. They knew exactly what they wanted to make but they had no clue about how it's made. They just wanted that device that they could use to compose music that they could make in the STEAM lab. So I had them go online and choose what, you know, uh, find a tutorial for how to make a MIDI controller. So they went over to Adafruit and found the hardest MIDI controller project that, it, that you could find online. It required everything, digital fabrication, it required coding and programming and all that stuff. Um, but at the time, and if that was the year Prince had died and I was playing a lot of Prince music in the lab. And I remember one of the, they were all music students and they had, they were being introduced to Prince as well because of music. So they're asking me to play what I thought was one of my favorite Prince songs, which isn't um, with his name on it. Like he goes by Jamie Starr. So I prayed 777-9311 by the time. And they liked it so much, I had to play it over and over again. And um, students said it helped him focus. So you would walk in the room and they're blasting um, 777 over and over again. And they're slaughtering, they're building their mini controllers. And um, there's something we're moving through electronics, which is engineering. We're doing a little bit of music. We got, you know, all these uh, computer science because they had to program their Arduinos. All this stuff is happening just to produce this one product. And then the outcome of that is that they're going to perform with these MIDI controllers. They're actually going to do their senior recitals and use these devices to compose music for their to graduate, um, which happened in one student's case. Some of these students were not in, um, interested in the conventional stuff that was happening in the class. And one particular student was never in class in the afternoons, um, was always in the hallway. This was the student who said that Prince's music made him focus. So this particular song made him focus and he stayed with the project through the end, including the programming and coding the Arduino part, which he had never done before. When I think of STEAM, I think about that project because it has every, lots of little things in there that are from different disciplines, different subject areas. So you had a little bit of electronics and engineering, you had a little bit of, of design, you had a little bit of digital fabrication and stuff, and you also had the music. Um, all of that was an important part of the process. So, but to be flexible that way, um, being able to move in mathematics into quilting and maybe into something else, into music, these are all things that can happen if you leave the door open 
for understanding how these things have connections. Um, and that's what I think of when I think of STEAM. Um, you know, always some kind of creative output, but how you get there might pass through one or more of those different subject areas in order to get to the, to the end result. Yes, thank you. So I see a question in the chat. Yes, from Maria. Um, Maria is asking, um, uh, from the virtual tools and projects, the projects start with a theme or idea uh, preset previ previous to the start of the project, maybe? Um, have you done projects where the youth themselves define the theme and directions? How have you adapted your path and curriculum to their choices? So that was the MIDI controller, right? That I didn't, I, I didn't really know what a MIDI controller was. I cared much about it. These students came in the door wanting to make a MIDI controller. I um, also had uh, students come for extra credit for chemistry, and came in the door and they said, "We had seen you do this stuff with the electric that paint. Can we make a dance floor and dance on it, and for our chemistry extra credit?" So they created an interface using the paint and an Arduino, and then danced on stage on that interface uh, with music playing as they danced across. Um, and then I went deeper with that in the book where I realized they had done something. I, I don't think me or the chemistry teacher realized it at the moment. The design of the interface is based on the research they did about graphite and how electrons move across the graphite. They actually went deeper into chemistry to create the design of the interface for the dance floor. So those are all students doing. The teacher, it was above our, the teacher's heads and they were able to do that um, on their own. And this is high school, of course, but still, I find that across the board students, um, there's always the outliers in every grade level that tend to go above and beyond. And that was one example as well as That's a mini controller. Awesome. All right, Michelle's got a couple questions for us. So. Mm -hmm. First, he's talking about how can we leverage techno vernacular creativity and making practices, uh, you know, to, to engage engineering uh, amongst minoritized populations? Um, yes, yeah, so we think a lot about the computational elements, you know, but there's a lot of engineering that's happening there too. It, and uh, for background, Michel doesn't have audio, but uh, he is uh, a trained engineer as well. Yeah. The one thing that's what I find about things that are appropriated from marginalized in, uh, cultures, it's never quite the same. It always, it doesn't quite sound or look the same as it was when it, was, when it started. And that's because the lens and the practice and all that stuff comes from, you know, it's passed down generation, over, uh, from generation to generation. Um, there's a particular aesthetic that's learned um, that doesn't cross and translate over to dominant um, practices. Um, even the way in which things are done, sometimes it's non-linear instead of linear. The whole thing about repetition and black cultural production, about not being linear and looping, these ideas of cyclical kinds of structures in both in music and in performances, they don't translate well across to Western ideas of time and space. So you can't quite get the nuances once, so it makes it difficult to formalize and to um, appropriate um, those things. Um, and so, it, you know, I was just I read this book, Dilla Time. I do recommend it for folks because it has some great toolkit stuff in there as well. Looking at um, Jay, uh, Jay Dilla's uh, production and how he went about doing things was very innovative, just the way Prince was, very innovative from his point, from his where he was sitting. And he was doing things, he couldn't afford the MPC production center. So he did something with a tape deck that nobody was doing. He re-engineered his tape deck to create the music that he, the samples that he made. Um, so we find examples of this kind of techno vernacular creativity happening across the board. Um, it's very difficult to formalize other than the fact that you create space for it and that you create um, some connections to some, some concepts that are important. Um, but you know, I was getting excited by the Dilla Time thing and came up with a project you know, at, at the time that I was reading it. And then um, I may still do it, but I just, it was just, it, this is steam, this is steam. I kept saying that to myself, there it is. This is TVC, he's doing it. Or he had done it, he's passed away. But um, I, see it, I see a lot, it just pops up everywhere when I'm looking at stuff, the invention and the inventiveness that happens. Um, but a lot of young people are, are divorced or separated from that 
um, because their teachers don't know it and it's not in the schools and no one's making the connections of these inventions when they are science or science when they're scientific thinking or computational thinking or um, to those works when it can be applied and that never happens, seldom happens for students. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. The uh, Michelle has a follow up question for you too. So, so you and this is probably our last question for today. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, folks, uh, you know, please, uh, please stay in touch and and uh, post a chat before you head out. Um, but the, uh, you know, his second question is, how do we as educational researchers, as, as informatics researchers, avoid sort of the colonizing and formalizing of, of the work that we're producing or the practices once they get into the dominant system? And you, you've created lots of, you know, art, tools, curriculum, um, you know, how, how, how do you sort of future-proof your work? Um, and then that's an example of the artwork that I make that's difficult to replicate. Like a machine can't do that alone. Um, it's still AI, it's still deep learning, it's still using algorithms that are set up for deep learning, but without that input, without my knowledge of what the what I want in terms of the outcome, it's not gonna be able to produce the same results. Similar to, so the technology is one step, obviously, to creating it. We wouldn't be able to do it easily, um, uh, analog-wise, manually, but you can um, have a way that to sort of control what's happening or control the, out, the outcome. Um, and I think that um, I, I, I feel confident now. I didn't feel I was just exploring, but I feel confident that I have some control. Like people say, well, I see these kind of random things coming out as output, but yours seems more controlled because it is. It's there's something happening in the, uh, in the process of creating that image that has the artist's hands taking over the process. And I think that's an important aspect of this technology or any of this stuff is that there's a local um, emic, um, you know, uh, personal cultural lens that's being applied that, that that's the inventiveness, that's the, the innovation, that's the part that then when you take on the machine or you take on the math or you take on the engineering, the output, the outcome is something that's very specific and very different um, maybe then. So it makes it more challenging for, for, for people to be able to appropriate or to, um, or to, to, to take or just to, you know, make more, try to bring it into the mainstream. Um, and that's why I push for that because I feel like right now, you know, our educational system doesn't really create innovators the way they could. Um, and sometimes in many cases, kids are discouraged from doing that work. And um, that's why I push for the book to be out there, but also just to try a different framework to, to really increase the chances for students to feel okay with tinkering and prototyping and um, being inventive with what they're doing, whether it's math or um, a, a maker class, so. Fantastic. Fantastic. And th thank you for doing that. Uh, you know, it's a great, you know, full circle back. Um, the book is very useful in terms of in terms of the framework and thinking about how you can apply that to both your design work to your educational praxis uh, and, and moving ahead. And I hope that you'll be be in touch uh, uh, with Dr. Gaskins uh, moving moving ahead as well. Uh, and I really quickly, I mentioned Stefania Druga, who's doing the AI research for families and younger students. I put the link of her Twitter feed um in the chat excellent excellent thank you thank you all and uh thank you for being with us on a friday afternoon dr gaskins it, it is a uh, you know it's been a long day for you thank you yes. thank you we really appreciate you and uh, i am i am so glad that we were able to make this happen i, I think you're going to see ripples uh for many years to come ahead uh through the inspiration that you've laid today so thank, thank you, you.